Word of God, which we'll ponder for a few moments, was the Old Testament reading read earlier from Joshua 24. Before we ponder God's word, we bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You are a rock and a redeemer. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, how many different places have you lived over the course of your life? How many different apartments, condos, townhomes, single-family residences, dormitories, long stays on mom's couch have you had over the course of your life? I want you to think of a number. There's a, a source that studies mobility rates, and the number that they came up with is 11.7. That's the average number of moves that a person in the United States makes over the course of a lifetime, 11.7. Now, that's the average person. If you grew up in a military family or were in the military, you probably moved far more. Or if you had a parent whose job was always transferring, there would be more moves. I had a church member at the church I served in Florida who worked for IBM, and he said the company joke is that IBM stands for, I've been moving. <laughs> Maybe you've moved quite a bit too. But what's interesting is that as life goes on, the number of moves starts to slow way down. That same source that studies the mobility rates said that at, after the age of 45, the average number of moves for the rest of your life is only about 2.7. So as people get older, and perhaps as finances and economics start to stabilize, people settle down and they settle in. Settling down and settling in might be one way to think about what's happening in the book of Joshua. So the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they've just completed that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and made it to the promised land of Canaan. The children of Israel, after being brought out of bondage of slavery in Egypt, eating that bread called manna for 40 years, now they're in the land of Canaan, filled with resources. Someone tried to count in Scripture the number of different places they stayed on that 40-year trip, and the number this person came up with was 42. 42 different places, but now, in the book of Joshua, they're there. They take conquest of the land of Canaan, and, and the land is distributed, and, and you get to it, to the end of the book, and you think, ah, finally, they can settle in, and they settle down. Well, this is chapter 24, and so the newness of this land has started to wear off. And so Joshua takes the leaders of Israel and he assembles them at a place called Shechem. And he has an important history lesson with them. And as he has this important history lesson, he calls them to recommit daily to their God. Important words for us to hear. I want to read these words one more time. This is what Joshua said to the leaders. He says, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. And as for me and my household, we'll serve the Lord. Joshua repeats kind of a, a sad moment in, in their ancestors' history. So he goes back to the time of Abram, in fact, the, his father, Terah, when they lived beyond the Euphrates River, and he says, you know, when they lived beyond the Euphrates, they didn't worship the Lord, they served other gods. And then when our ancestors lived in Egypt, there were times when they didn't worship the Lord, they served other gods. And Joshua's bringing this up as if to say, do you notice a pattern here, people? When we lived among those people, we adopted their gods. When we lived among those people, our ancestors adopted their gods. And now he brings it to the present, to the leaders. He said, you're in this new land and you're surrounded by the Amorites. So what are you going to do? Are you going to repeat the pattern of your ancestors, serving the gods like they did of the nations around them? Choose this day whom you'll serve. And he says, as for me and my household, we'll serve the Lord. What about you and your household. 
I think we can hear Joshua's history lesson and go, well, this is not a struggle for me. I don't even know who the gods are beyond the Euphrates. I've heard of Egyptian gods, but I'm not going to worship them. And who are the Amorites again? Okay, good. Maybe these aren't concerns for you. But you need to start to think about the place in which you live. And the gods and the values of the people who live around you. Because when you live in a culture and society, sometimes you can breathe that in, you can soak it in, and start to follow the values, the gods, the deities, and the people around you, even when you don't realize it. Let me illustrate this. So I was doing some reading to this effect. What do people outside of America think about Americans that we don't always realize about ourselves? In other words, when an American travels overseas or to another country, what do those people think? Or when they come here, what do they observe that we don't always realize? And some of it's kind of humorous. Uh, one person wrote, what's up with all the white socks? Why are Americans fascinated with white socks? Why do you put ice in your drinks and have such large drinks and, and fast food? Another person said, why is it acceptable to wear pajamas in public? That's beyond me. And some of them are humorous, but then they start to get down a little deeper and maybe get closer to home. One person wrote, why do Americans idolize sports? Money. They're kids. Why do Americans crave convenience and they can't stand a little bit of inconvenience? Why are Americans so discontent? Why are they so vain? They're so about appearances that things look good on the outside, that things are happy when inside they're not. One person wrote, why do Americans idolize themselves? Okay, they didn't say it that way, but they pointed out how some cultures are very collectivistic. They think about the family, they think about the society. And this person said, when I look at Americans, they're only thinking about me, myself, and I. And so the impression of outsiders looking in is that the people around us can be self-centered, self-absorbed, self-serving, and really don't care about anyone else. Now I think we can hear stuff like that and say, well, that's not us. We're very different. Or we can acknowledge that we breathe the same air as people around us. We can acknowledge that we have a sinful heart inside of us that's constantly turning away from God. We can acknowledge that we have a foe in the devil who's trying to pull us away from God. I want you to think back over the last few days, maybe a few weeks of your life, and if we just observed you, just to listen to you, what does it reveal about whom you serve and what your values are? I'll give you a, a snapshot from my life. About a week or so ago, we had to take a car in for a repair, and the mechanic said it will be done on this day or this time. Well, at this day and this time, the mechanic called and said, sorry, it's going to be two more days. Do you think I thought, as my first thought, oh, thank goodness you're doing your job thoroughly. Take all the time you need. No, I didn't. In fact, I thought to myself, this is so inconvenient. My time is precious. I don't have time for this. That same day, I, after getting off the phone, I was working on my computer, and I clicked on something, and it didn't work, and I clicked on it again, and it didn't work, and I clicked on it a third time, and it took, I counted, three seconds for it to open up, and I thought, this is so inconvenient. If I'm being honest, I'm a little too excited about football. I watch stocks and care too much about money, and sometimes I lift up my kids even above the Lord God. So if somebody was observing my life, they could say, you worship the God of convenience. You think a lot about yourself, and you're chasing a lot of things that in the end really don't matter. What would someone say about you? And who you serve? That which you turn to be your source of good in times of trouble, that which you rely on to bring you good, that's your God. In fact, one theologian said that the, the human heart, the sinful heart, is an idol factor. In other words, we're always building these gods and we're always building these idols to follow. My friends, when we breathe this air, when we have a sinful nature, when we have a devil who's tempting us, it is so easy for us to forsake the Lord and start following other things. To which we say, God, have mercy on us. God, protect us. God, forgive us. He does. 
Because that's the God that he is. And he knows this. I, I said that Joshua's lesson here was a history lesson, but I think it's actually more of a geography lesson. Did you notice where Joshua assembled all these leaders of Israel for this important message? I'm going to read verse 1 one more time. It says, Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. Why there? Was it like, like centrally located? So Joshua's like, okay, it'll be about 25 miles for that tribe, 25 miles for that tribe, 25 miles for that tribe. Did, did Joshua go online and he's like, okay, where's a good place, a good resort, good prices that everybody can come? No, this was not a random rendezvous point. This was very strategic. So you start to ask, okay, well, where does this city come out elsewhere in Scripture? Well, we got a page back in the Bibles. When you go back to the book of Genesis, to the time of Abraham, he was called Abram at that time. God said to Abram, leave your family, your people, and go to the land I show you. And I will make your name great, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram and his wife Sarai, by faith, they got up and went. And they go to this new land. Do you know where their first stop was? In fact, the Bible tells us that Abram built an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. Do you want to guess what place he stopped at? Shechem. And then God added a promise there at Shechem. He said, to your descendants, Abram, I'll give this land. So fast forward back to the book of Joshua. Here's Joshua years later. And where are they assembled? Right there where God made the promise. As if to say to the people, this is what fulfillment feels like. God promised that he would give Abram's descendants this land. And guess what? You're Abram's descendants. And you're on the land. Go ahead and take off your sandals and squish your toes in the sand. Because that's what fulfillment is. You have a God who promises. You have a God who fulfills. You don't have what others have, an inanimate God, a not real God. No, you have a living God who's faithful from generation to generation, who rescued you from Egypt, who's going to rescue you from far more, from sin, from death, from the power of the devil. This is the God you have. To which we would say, well, that's the God we have too. That we have a God who's made promises to us who's called us his very own, and our God always keeps those promises. Go ahead, wiggle your toes right now. No, you're not in the promised land of Canaan, but you're in a land of promise, aren't you? That it's here at God's house, and it's here in God's word that we hear the promises that he's made. It's there at his table that we receive the promise of his forgiveness in bread and wine, that God promises and God fulfills. Some have said that's actually the theme of the book of Joshua. That God makes his promises and he's always faithful to them. Whether they're small promises or big promises, from lasting year to year, from generation to generation. In fact, Joshua said this in chapter 23. He said, you know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. I made a lot of promises to my kids over the years. My children could not say about their father. Not one of my father's promises has failed. In fact, they could start listening to mom pretty quickly. And yet the children of the Heavenly Father, we can say not one of his promises has failed. <laughs> that when he promised that he would send a descendant of Abraham who would live, die, and rise for us, he came. When he promises to us that your sins are forgiven, that he's intervened in your life at your baptism and made you his very own, he means it. I think this is important because before we talk about serving God, before we talk about our commitment to God, we have to stop and marvel at God serving us. In fact, Jesus said that, didn't he? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. Before we talk about committing ourselves daily to the Lord, we have to marvel at how committed our God is to us to make us his very own. But then we ask, okay, well, what does this mean for our lives? What does serving the Lord look like in daily life? Well, we could talk a long time today. I'm going to give you three takeaways. They're more broad, but three takeaways. Three things we pray for and God gives as we serve him. The first thing is this. We pray that God would give us hearts of humility. 
So Joshua has this history geography lesson with them, and he says, so choose, are you going to serve the Lord each and every day? And this is what they said, verse 16. Far be it for us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. We too will serve the Lord, because he is our God. And you'd say, wonderful. It's a fantastic answer. How did they do an execution? Well, this is the book of Joshua. Do you remember the next book of the Bible? It's the book of Judges. And after Joshua died, in chapter 2 of Judges, it says, a new generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor, nor what he had done for Israel. And I think you can hear that history of people who strayed from the Lord and you can say, well, that's not going to be me. I'm not going to fall for what they did. Or we can humble ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, without your grace and favor, I go astray. Lord, keep me close to you. Lord, when I start to stray, call me back in repentance and fill me up with your forgiveness. God, give us hearts of humility in our service. The second thing we ask, God, keep us devoted to you. So I've been thinking about John chapter 6 before. Jesus is teaching the bread of life. I paused when I read it. Did you notice this? Jesus is teaching and people were hooting and hollering going, great, great sermon, Jesus. Great sermon. In fact, they got up and left. Thank you for not getting up and leaving. They got up and walked away. In fact, they started to leave him. And Jesus turns and he looks at his disciples and he says to the twelve, you don't want to leave too, do you? Did you get Peter's answer? I love Peter's answer. He says, Lord, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Think about that. Lord, where are we going to go? Every day, there are voices that are calling you to follow them. Maybe online we'll call them influencers. People who say, I have what you need to really live. If you follow me, you will really have life that is life. And those words from Scripture remind us, there's only one who gives us life that is truly life. Lord, where do we go except for you? You have the words of eternal life. So give us a heart that's devoted to you and devoted to your word. Here's a third thing. So we ask for a heart of humility, a heart of devotion. We ask for hearts that serve him daily and fully. I bet you've been to a wedding before where Joshua 24 is one of the readings. It's often used at a Christian wedding. Very, very good. It's a great text. My wife and I even have a wall hanging at home that says, As for me and my household, we'll serve the Lord. It's wonderful. But I hope you realize Joshua is not getting married here. And Joshua is not officiating at a wedding. You know how old Joshua is around the time of this text? He's 110. He's near the end of his life. And at the end of his life, Joshua's not like, Well, it's been a good run. I think I'm going to coast into eternity. As a 110-year-old man, he says, no, today, me and my household will serve the Lord. Every day, me and my household will serve the Lord. Whether you're 10 years old or 110, aren't we faced with this question every morning we get up? For whom will I live today? Am I going to live for myself? Am I going to live for the things of this world that will all pass away? We pray that God would continue to lead us to say, no, far be it for us. We too will serve the Lord, because he is our God. God comforts you with the power of his word, with, with that confidence that he's intervened in your life, that he loves you dearly. And then God gives you clarity and confidence as you serve him, you and your household.